It's Christian Buckley doing another MVP buzz chat, and I'm talking today with Nick. Hello. Hey, thanks for having me, Christian. Appreciate being here. Well, it's it's great to have you here too. And I think I, I was trying to I had to go back through my catalog and and find out, but I, you're the second or the third former alumni MVP to do the interview series. And again, this this invite yeah. is open to people that are former MVPs or RDs to come and and participate as well because you're still in the community. Like I, yeah. I was trying to remember, like I met you like at least like 10 years ago or something. Yes. It was eons ago. We were, yeah. we were little kids in it back then or of course. something. Yes, exactly. But for folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you and what do you do? Okay. Good, good question. So I'll give you the, the, maybe the, the primer, uh, been 30 years in tech. Uh, I originally got certified, uh, in Microsoft certified in 1995, my MVP number, uh, sorry, my MCP number. I get too oh, many numbers these days, yeah. has five digits. Um, and I was once actually accused of not having enough digits at TechEd when they were giving away free hats for people that had MCPs. Anyway, so um, I, I, I've made my living a, in a very interesting way. I've both been a technologist. I've, back in the day of on-prem, I designed networks for the likes of Fox News and Carnival Cruise Lines and Brock's Candy and Hummer and the Chicago Tribune and the list went on and on. Um, and been a VP of marketing for three tech companies, helped one grow to 50 million and two to 20, was sort of a quasi-technical evangelist during that 10-year stint before the term came out. Yep. I think they called me the golden throat, which just doesn't really have that's, the same that's flair. That's awkward. That's uncomfortable. Yeah, it's a very awkward, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It makes me uncomfortable right now just saying it. But um, And then uh, became an MVP as part of a, like the last, oh, call it the last dozen plus years um, where I was just being a, a freelance technical evangelist and doing a lot of writing and speaking, which is sort of what got me in a position to be able to become an MVP in the first place. And then sort of post MVP and I guess, uh, current while I was an MVP, I founded a company called conversational geek oh. and conversational geek. It, it was intended on providing third-party branded content to technical companies that are looking for something. You can think of like the, oh, dare I say the name with the D, the dummies books. Yeah. Oh, I think I threw it in my mouth a little bit. I didn't, I'm just teasing. But, um, but you know, our audience, they're not dummies. You know, the, the, the joke I like to use is the, uh, the, the book called, uh, you know, hyperconverged SQL servers in the cloud for completely stupid people. It just doesn't really have the same, you know, right. vibe to it. And so we founded Conversational Geeks, sort of for geeks by geeks and so on. And so I've, I've made, largely made my living doing that as well as doing, doing some writing and speaking for a wide range of companies that need someone who is either at the time a, a current MVP or now a former MVP, just who's out there in the industry seeing what's going on and talking about the trends and that sort of thing with technology. So I've got a, a very unique background that makes me sort of half marketing and half technical. And I found a way to culminate the two and create assets for, for marketing folks in, uh, in tech companies. Today. And that's great. And I've actually um, know a couple of people that you've worked with. Um, one, I was talking with Sherry Oswald, who mentions mm -hmm. you guys all the time. And mm -hmm. as a, it is where, as she and I are actually working on content and that will become mm -hmm. a book next year. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we may be giving you a call to talk about uh, publishing. Sure. Years. So, but it's, um, yeah, it's for folks that aren't familiar with Conversational Geek, definitely go take a look. And especially if you have been thinking about writing a book, as I always say with writing a book, Nick, I don't know if you agree with this or not, it was the most work you can do for the least amount of money. <laughs> um, well, that's <laughs> funny. Author, for, for, yeah, you're, you're, you're talking about an author. Yes, it's right. like if you could write this thousand page book and we'll pay you, you know, get something up front and then never get anything on the back. Right. It just happens. But, but yeah. there's, it's interesting because I did that. I've written a couple of books in the traditional model published with McGraw-Hill in the back in the day. Um, I still, oddly enough, get um, get my reports quarterly of how my balance is like negative 27 cents. And I think yeah. of how they're wasting that stamp every time, but okay. Yeah. Um, but, but it was still good for building the credibility that I'm an established author. And that's actually one of the, and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, pitch Conversational Geek to the audience, although at the same time, there's some benefits, so why not mention it? But people that are trying to establish their own 
sort of uh, personal brand and they try to figure out, you know, let me establish myself as an author. That's one of the reasons why you're, you mentioned, if you're an author, take a look. We have a whole section on experts. You click on experts in the menu, shows up all of our experts that are there, what's kind of required. We have this down to a, a process, been doing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of eBooks that it, it's pretty simple for the author. And we try to make them really look good, make sure their name's on the front cover, they get the picture on the back. You know, there's a lot of promotional benefit there. We always encourage people that have their, either they're trying to get their MVP or people that are renewing their MVP, make sure you mention the books because you have these eBooks that you've created yeah. and especially if they're Microsoft related, but, of course. But you're and, right. I mean, from an authority standpoint, you go out and do that. It's like, look, that's why I started. I mean, my, when I, I started a software company in 97, I've also been in tech for 33 years now. Yeah, so, you're as old as I am. Um, yeah, they, but uh, the, the first book was a self-pub. We did a limited run. We sold every one of them. Because we were mm -hmm. both actively consulting and we we were living what we wrote about and would yep. you know, we would go in and do workshops with 40, 50 people in the room and part of what they paid to get into the workshop bought them the book. So we did that and walked through that. Yeah. And it was I, I always tell people, I said, we made the most money on that first book because we did a hundred percent of it. Um, the second book, but that book led to getting published with Addison Wesley. The third mm -hmm. book was IBM press. Um, the fourth book was back with, I don't know, it was another, you know, imprint. I think it was another Addison Wesley imprint or something. Um, the sure. first SharePoint book or was it Wiley? Oh, it was Wiley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know. I've got them in a box in the closet somewhere. Um, but, uh, and then did a couple that were through a, a, a like a publisher similar to Conversational Geek that mm -hmm. was smaller, but had, you know, the, the better chance of getting the word out, publishing, getting mm -hmm. it in front of more people. Um, but there are so many different ways you could do that, but it, it really depends. Like if I were to advise authors and I've done this like one-to-one, -one, give this advice mm -hmm. for people that are like new to the publishing world is that um, how you market your content and is true about so much about our mm -hmm. personal brands plays into how successful that book was again mm -hmm. we made the most money off the first one because it was a tool that we used in yeah. our our consulting um so uh, it's a great way and that's what charity and i are doing with this new content this next year so Very i nice. actually have two books in the works right now so um but anyway it's it's a uh I, it's an interesting space. That's not just what I wanted to talk to you about. I would like to talk to about, I think this is a great opportunity to talk about two things. Like one, like what changed about your, your role in the community? Because I'm sure people want to know as a former MVP, like what changed mm -hmm. that you, you know, left the, the, the program or, or was not renewed, whatever that, that was. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And then, uh, uh, and like, what do you miss from, from that? Let's talk about that. Um, but then, and also like how you've remained being outside of the program, an active part of the, the community. So we would talk first, like where, where things ended in uh, 22. So let me, let me actually rewind the clock slightly farther back than that. One of the reasons I was able to get in the program was I was doing so much writing and speaking um, that, I mean, I, I would have seven pages of submissions of stuff that's all relevant to Microsoft. It's all talking about how to, you know, get it implemented properly or how to make sure it's secure or make sure that it, the data is protected. Or I, I normally would focus on a, a couple of key areas, which is like business continuity, cloud adoption, uh, cybersecurity, MSP related issues, maybe some compliance. So those are kind of like the sweet spots, if you will, that I normally run home to mama for. Those are the things I feel comfortable with. And so I got into the program through just the, the sheer proliferation of content that I had created. And then to answer your question, what, what sort of had me um, exit the program was I, I didn't spend enough time doing the things that were also necessarily like you should be making suggestions about the products at Microsoft. You should be participating in the forums online and the, and the yeah. Slack channel. And the, I, I just didn't have time, you know. But before the, we started this call today, you and I were talking real quick about how busy we both were and that sometimes people just go, ah, you're just sort of making that up. We're like, no, or we're just actually busy. I was too busy. And so it's my own fault, if you will, because those are the requirements. And they're pretty clear on the website at the time. I don't know if they've changed since, but it was, there were four different sets of requirements. And I think I really met two of them concretely. So, okay. So now exit the program. And then since then though, um, there's still this benefit for those people that are, are watching this and or listening, depending on how you're consuming this. 
thinking about joining an MVP program like this, where I still get some benefit from it. I still can say I was a four-time Microsoft MVP because it's true. Yeah. Right. And and I found that that's sort of the way to to position it. It's not like former, although you have to put all these words before. If you right. just say four-time Microsoft MVP, people generally get that means you used to be. And if they don't, it becomes, it went pretty overt about it anyways. Right. Um, but you still get the benefit because you were still one of, roughly speaking, 3,000 IT professionals every year to get picked to be one. That's that's a pretty small, small margin. And so these days I still leverage my MVP by still doing the very same writing and speaking that all benefits the Microsoft community. Um, it could be purely about cybersecurity in a, a Windows environment. Um, just finished writing um, an ebook uh, for Conversational Geek as the publisher and um, uh, Quest was the sponsor. And it was about... Um, about basically Active Directory and Entra ID and how to make sure that you secure those, particularly around groups, because groups is still an issue because yep. nobody actually manages groups. They just right. leave them alone. But you know, that's right. the secret. That's the thing we don't we don't talk about. But anyway, so you know, but it, it, it just it's where I still get to leverage that, and I think that that's the benefit is um, having the having the the moniker that still exists around my name, I get to at least get some attention for it. And and it just gives me an opportunity to share because that's really what I like doing. That's why I do this work. It's not because, um, how do I say this? It's not like cry, like, don't you know I'm a Microsoft? Uh, I don't care about right. that. It's more like I'm a Microsoft MVP or former MVP. Wow, I get this really great opportunity to, to share with people all the stuff that I know. And I know that we're kindred spirits there. That's why we've been doing this for 20 something years, you know, within our 30 something year career. It's just because we like sharing. We like educating other people. And what I already found out, you don't have to go through all the hassle that I did and, and that sort of thing. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, I think it does. I mean, it, it's uh, I'm kind of two things that made me think of. So another good friend of mine, uh, Liam Cleary, also, uh, you know, no longer an MVP. And and he, uh, he, it, now, like, he expressed there was a little bit of FOMO initially, but I mean, he's still doing mm -hmm. the things that he's doing. True. He's doing less of the social, the outwardly visible, but like incredibly busy, busy with clients, doing things, still blogs, still creates content for partners and other things, mm -hmm. still is speaking at conferences, doing kind of all those other things, but is no longer like worried about joining those Microsoft product team calls and keeping yeah. up with the roadmap. And, and, and because the reality is there's a lot of things that are talked about that it might be a year or two before any of my clients are actually ready to go look at those things, do anything with that. And, and it, having us both been in a software world, we know that that d the delivery date always slips. The GA date always gets pushed out, well, always gets pushed out. It never comes in early. So, you know. Well, that's what being on the marketing side, the other reality too, is that, you know, my, Microsoft, there's ebbs and flows where it gets good about talking about things that are actually close to reality or are actually available Yeah. versus being so out ahead of the marketing, so out in front of what's actually there. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just, it causes confusion and, and even some anger in the marketplace where customers that go like, like I, I saw this thing. It's like, yeah, there's the previews not even open yet. They said in the fall, the preview will be there. Why are they showing us now? It's like, because their event was scheduled and that yep. team needed to talk about something. So understanding the marketing side of that, you know, yeah. benefit, but no, I mean, the other side, the rest of what you talked about though, uh, uh is it, you're right. It's like. You can't take away the fact that you were part of the program mm -hmm. um, and you can still leverage that. You've still, it's not like you suddenly lost all the knowledge and the expertise that you had that got you into the MVP program. 100%. It's just that your priorities and things just changed around that. One thing I always talk about is that like I was doing the stuff that I do before I was an MVP throughout and after I leave the program, I'll be doing the same stuff because it's- 100%. it's just, it's me. It's who I do. I'll be doing the interviews. I may not do this exact interview. I maybe. Yeah. I, I don't see why I wouldn't. You know. But um, I, you know, but I'll have all the rest of the th the series, the things that I do, the content that I create, the writing, the speaking, all of that, because I'm doing it because I enjoy it. If I didn't 100%. like doing it, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. And that's something that just sort of lives on. And it's one of the reasons why Conversational Geek, I think, is really interesting for me as a business, because the goal is I don't want to be the one that writes. All. I write a lot of the stuff still because I enjoy writing still. I like sharing things, especially topics I know really well. But I remember when I started this um, this company, actually with another former uh, Microsoft MVP, J. Peter Brzezzi. Who just got it back. Friend. Just earned it back. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. So congrats to, to J. Peter. And... Um, 
and so in, in when we were doing this, he's like, oh, can't you can't you just can't wait to start writing ebooks? I said, no, 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 no. They said, Peter, Peter, no, no, no. I never want to read one of our books. I never want to write one of our books. And I meant it more tongue in cheek, just meaning right. like, otherwise the product is me and I don't want to be the product. Right. And so the other side of this is there's this interesting aspect for MVPs where just like I mentioned, where I try to remind MVPs, hey, don't forget to include your eBooks, you know, when you do your submissions this year by March 31st, blah, 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 is somebody who, who's an MVP that want, or a former MVP that just wants to ha add an eBook on, we'd love to have them because they have something to share. And our model is a little different because we're waiting for a, a, a company to come to us saying, we want a book on widget making. And then we have to go find, you know, an MVP in widget making. And then we have them write a book on widget making for right. the sponsor. But still, it's this great opportunity for multiple MVPs to to have an outlet for their writing. And it doesn't have to go through all that hassle you talked about with like the different publishers. And it takes, you know, what, six months to get an ebook done. You know, our world record was 10 business days. I wrote the book, don't ever make me do that again. Oh, but yeah. generally it's like 45 days to write an right. ebook, time to start to finish. And so there's something out very quickly. And, and so the sponsor wins, the author wins, it's all templated. It's, we make it super easy for them to just kind of set them up for success. So they're not like going, so what should I write about? You know, I just know the topic. No, nah, no, nah, we help you spell that out real easily. And, and that there's an outlet for them. And I like that too, because now I can multiply my desire to share beyond just what I can write or what you can write. Like, you know, with you and I have being these kindred spirits, it's what 60, 80 other people on the bench can write. And that number can keep increasing. It just depends on who's the right person for the right topic. Do you do it the other way around? Do you have people that come to you and say, hey, look, I've got this idea, like th this this perspective, and then you shop that to companies that might be interested in sponsoring? We've done some of that, um, but it tends to be more because they're strategic assets. We find that the, the, uh, the, the normal way around, if you will, that is, you know, Widget Co. comes to us, says we'd like a book on Widget. Like we're doing, a, there's a pen testing company does pen testing management and they wanted somebody to write an ebook on pen testing management. And so right. we know somebody that's doing really good pen testing and they know all the process and they know all the pitfalls and they're a perfect candidate for that ebook. We put them together and we're making an ebook for that vendor. So just, it's more like that where they have this need for some third-party content. But yeah, we do shop around sometimes. We've done that like one on uh, MITRE ATT&CK framework. We just did one of those. Um, thinking about doing one on NIST. Uh, the NIST CSF is another example because vendors can show how they align with it. And we just try to find some very unique types of uh, ways of taking an ebook, uh, you know, asset and making an interesting product out of it that aligns with somewhere in the marketing sales buyer's journey, if you will. It's interesting. So something, again, parallel to that is I had a uh, relationship with um, the leadership at the Marriott School of, of Management there at uh, BYU, mm -hmm. so the, the mm -hmm. uh, graduate program. And I pitched something to Jeff Teepers, now the president for his business mm -hmm. applications or the, uh, the productivity and I don't know, whatever the title is now, collaboration sure. tools, SharePoint teams, all that. Um, and I pitched the idea to him and, and he said, yeah, let's do it. And we hit the Microsoft ended up funding a, a, un, a original research um, project around this. So it was like a six month project to go and do this research around mm -hmm. um, on-prem SharePoint and they had no data uh, around that. And so uh, anyway, to go and, to, and do that. So I, I ended up doing about a dozen projects. Microsoft was a co-sponsor of about half of those and nice. other ISVs and companies. Um, you know, and it's, I enjoyed doing that. Um, I, I didn't quite have the model where I could do that full time and just be, become mm -hmm. a researcher doing that kind of work. But, but again, it's something that is, I mean, I think this is that I loved about it. One, going in and doing the, the, the first party, the, the research, that aspect, interviewing mm -hmm. people, interviewing companies, talking with, you know, the product teams, talking about the, the roadmap, all those things. It's one of those things that I put in the category of the way that I just de described this. Like if I could get funding from one or multiple sources to be a full-time MVP, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. sort of another, but go and find out, learn and become an expert on the topic. And then mm -hmm. write about it, speak about it on that on behalf of those sponsoring companies and be their expert for that. It, it's not a bad business model. I mean, that makes a lot Love of sense. It really business. does. Yeah. It's just that in uh, what I found having been like a full-time technical evangelist at large, mm -hmm. where never promoted anyone's product, being a Microsoft MVP was the closest because you're associated. But for some reason, Microsoft just gets a pass. I don't know, you know why that is, but they just do. But I never promoted anyone else's product on purpose. But I would talk about the problem and I would talk about, uh, you know, what the solution might look like, not the product, but here's the best practices or the pitfalls to avoid, or here's how you establish a, a plan or whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish. 
And, but it was you know, the cart before the horse. Like I already had to have the experience and, and I already had the credentials, yeah. you know, but what you're talking about makes a lot of sense where it's like if Microsoft had a brand new product and you go, I'll be the MVP for that. Just let me know. And, you know, as obviously if it interests you and so on, but right. I think that business model actually has legs and could actually be viable if it was a big enough company like a Microsoft and yeah. it was a brand new product. They had no MVPs on. You're like, I'll do it. Pick me yeah. up. Well, that's I, so. I was the chief evangelist for three different ISVs, mm -hmm. and uh, and then CMO, and I did evangelism mm -hmm. as the CMO for for a fourth company. But where I so I was, you know, I had my, you know, I was backed by a product, a solution. Um, but mm -hmm. I believed in those those products, was passionate right. about those. Like I, I, I've had other offers, and I'm just like that, and I can't. I don't know that space. It's not my area. Um, somebody approached me out writing something on the security side. And I said, besides an overview, I mean, I like it's just not my space. No one would believe it if I wrote that book or that ebook or even a white paper on that that topic. Like mm -hmm. it's not my space. Um, but being in that role, having that with a company that you know, being the 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 face of of that product for that company out there. Again, I love doing that role. It's why I'm a product guy. But there yeah. are so few of those evangelist roles anymore like like that and so you're right yeah. it has to be the right right company the right opportunity and the right space to go in and build out that marketplace it's not as great for an established everybody knows what it is you don't need to have that evangelist you know where the the company could be up there yeah. doing that not in the same way at least but yeah it's uh no i mean it's a, it's an interesting space and and again it sounds like we've had a lot of you know, a lot of uh, parallels in our, yeah, what we've some done similar in experiences. Role, so. Yes. Agreed. It was very cool. Yeah. Well, I, so the last um, question for you is just to talk about like, so what are you like personally, what, what are you passionate about? What do you, what do you like? Do you, are you still doing any speaking as well? Uh, I still do actually quite a bit of speaking uh, on, on as much as, you know, my customers are, are interested in having me. We do some of our own webinars as well. Um, uh, I don't know if you know, you remember Randy Franklin Smith, um, Randy, yeah. Randy used to be in the, you, if, I'm going I'm to say Randy used to be in the event log space as if there was an event log space, yeah. but you know, moved, moved into, cause he was just like the event log guy became into more of a seam solution type of a space and now does nothing but cybersecurity. And so I do some speaking on Randy's webinars, uh, periodically just cause Randy's doing some other things that are a little more strategic and asked me to step in. So I'm honored to do that for him. So I do some speaking there. We do our own webinars and then. Once in a while, I have other customers ask me to speak. And uh, I'm also uh, branching out and doing some speaking at some other conferences as, as I'm able to. Obviously, we supply our, you know, hit the RFP, you go ahead and put in a proposal and if they select you and so on. But I, I still that a, a tremendous amount. I do enjoy that. Plus, I like doing it live. I like just talking to people, being, you know, pressing the flesh a little bit and seeing if the way we see the world is still correct as opposed to, you know, that you talked about doing the analysis and that kind of thing. At some point, we can sort of get like you know, kind of mushed down by all the data and just think that that's how the way the world works as opposed to someone going, that's not what we do in the real world at all. Oh, I had no idea because yeah. you only know, go as your experiences. So that's yeah. why I think, I, I oh, that. so no matter what role that you're in, you've got to make sure that you're only no further than, you know, you know, one and a half, two steps at most away from the yeah. actual end user clients, you know, customer what you're doing. So uh, otherwise you do lose touch. And, 100%. Which happens a lot with product teams and like, yeah, oh man, they drink their own Kool Aid really eventually, no matter what who you work for. And it's just like people don't want that. Maybe yes, they do. No, no, they don't. No, that I, I have those conversations. Hey, it, it is a skill though to be able to 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 differentiate between what's the marketing and the reality. I mean, there there's a reason mm -hmm. why there are highly trusted product team members at Microsoft. Where if I know I see them in a conference and go and ask them a question, they give the official product answer, and then we can step behind a door, close the door, and then have an actual conversation of like, here's what I'm actually seeing. And the product team like share, again, the, the, the good ones will, will be like mm -hmm. still in a, you know, a, a, a it, it's, it's constructive, you know, yeah. conversation around that, but we'll be more open about that. But that's, again, having those relationships, that's one of the reasons that I love you know, the MVP program. I still would have a lot of those contacts, but wouldn't be on a bunch of the calls that give me the view weeks or yeah. months in advance. Um, but again, you've got those same connections. They didn't stop answering your calls when you be, no. stop being an MVP. So, 100%. That's true. 
Well, Nick, really appreciate your time getting to, getting to talk to you again. Uh, for folks that want to contact you, where are you most active in social? Where can people find you? Oh, boy. Um, I would probably say uh, you, you can try Twitter, try Conversational Geek on Twitter. You can also visit our website. There's just a ton of content there as well. Uh, and that's only growing every day. Uh, there's webcasts, there's podcasts, there's uh, ebooks galore. So that that's something as well to look at. That's just conversationalgeek.com. Um, but I, I would probably say, you know, still looking at Twitter and uh, and we're actually expanding even on LinkedIn as well. And for folks, especially the ISVs, which is primarily my clientele out there, or the ISVs in the Microsoft ecosystem, if you're looking to create a hero piece and want to get the influence of outside experts out of your product team, your writers, who I'm sure do a fantastic job, but getting yeah, that different perspective and that expertise and being able to lean on that, you definitely want to reach out. Talk to Nick, talk to Conversational Geek. Yeah, thank so, you Nick, much, Christian. Thanks a lot. All right.